Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that about a third of American adults sleep less than six hours a night, according to a brand new, very broad survey of about 400,000 respondents. About 32.9% reported that short sleep in 2017, up from 28% in 2004. What they're finding is that people are sleeping significantly less from 2013 onward. And the trend has increased most among black and Hispanic people, more so there than among white people, which I'm not sure why. And there's a 15% increase representing more than 9 million people about the population of New York City. And it's possible people are sleeping less than than what they reported because people overestimate the number of hours they sleep. If you use sleep tracking like I do, you might say, oh, I was in bed for you know, six and a half or seven hours, but you might have only gotten six hours of sleep because you woke up or because it took you a while to go to sleep and things like that. Uh, the researchers who did the study believe that it's probably stress or overuse of technology. And I got to say, those bright white screens, the rise of the iPhone in 2009 may have been uh, may have been related to this, uh, not just the iPhone, but all of the things with with big screens like that. And according to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and Sleep Research, seven or more hours per night is the recommended sleep time. According to the Bulletproof Dave Asprey perspective, people who sleep more than eight hours a night die more than people who sleep six and a half hours a night. So if you need more than eight hours of sleep, get it and deal with your health because healthy people need less sleep. You guys know that I'm a master of foreshadowing, but today I failed miserably because I'm also embracing my uh, ability to fail. Uh, because today we are not going to be talking about sleep <laughs> at all. <laughs> <laughs> we instead are going to be talking with an organizational psychologist named Adam Grant, who's one of the world's 10 most influential management thinkers. He's on the Fortune 40 under 40 list. And a top-rated professor at Wharton, a New York Times columnist, a TED Talk favorite, and just an amazing guy who's uh, who's very well known for looking at how humans interact. And we're going to learn more about that side of biohacking today uh, from Adam, where we really uh, just just dig in and understand what's going on at work. How do human dynamics happen? Adam, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here, Dave. All right. You became a tenured professor at Wharton while still in your 20s. Uh, Were you uh, mistreated as a child or something? Why are you an overachiever? (laughs) You know, I remember, (laughs) I'm I'm sure there are are many, uh, many dark (laughs) explanations. But (laughs) the, the thing that stands out from my childhood was, I remember when I was a kid, my mom would always say, you know, no matter what grade you get, as long as you tried your hardest, I'll be proud of you. And then she would add, but if you didn't get an A, I'll know you didn't try your hardest. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there it is. Here we are. All right. Well, it worked, right? <laughs> mission, mission accomplished. Uh, well, speaking of mission, I, I actually don't really believe you there. Uh, your first book, Give and Take, Why Helping Others Drive Our Success, uh, is really about why that that act of service to others uh, is something that's motivating. And as a teacher, I mean, I taught for five years at the University of California. And as a teacher, if you're invested in the success of your students, it's it's exceptionally rewarding. And it, is that really what's driving all of the different things that you're doing uh, to to share the knowledge you have? Is it that that mission to help others, or is it something else going on? I think we're always driven by multiple motives. Uh, but I definitely, I was, uh, I was one of those college students who hated the question, you know, what, what are you going to do for your career? And actually, I, I hated it as a kid, too. Like, there's, there's almost no worse question you could ask me than, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because I, I felt like I didn't want to be one thing. I wanted to do many things. And I think part of my, my uncertainty when I was in college was not knowing where I could find a job that was both interesting to me and meaningful in the impact it would have on others. And so I think I've, you know, as, as long as I can be, as long as I can remember, I've, I've kind of been fueled by both of those motivations, uh, you know, to, 
to do work that I think is interesting and achieve my goals, but do that in a way that that's helpful to others. And so, you know, there are times when when those align beautifully. That's one of the things I, I love about, you know, writing and podcasting and speaking is when you hit an, on an idea that you're fascinated by that other people find interesting or useful. Uh, it feels like, you know, it's sort of a win-win. But there are also moments when those <laughs> motives diverge, like when I'm staring at email number 300 and thinking, there is no way that answering this email is going to do me any good whatsoever. Uh, and I'm really bored by it, but maybe it'll help others. And now I have a choice to make. Got it. That's a, a very uh, a balanced way of motivating yourself. Uh, but don't you... I mean, don't you still get burned out? Like, okay, now there's 307 emails, and this one could help others. Like, do you, do you get caregiver fatigue? I mean, is this a, a common problem for you or for the executives that you studied in your work? Um, I think we all go through it. I've, you know, I've definitely had moments of, you know, definitely the the emotional exhaustion that gets described in burnout a lot. And one of the reasons that I, I started studying this dynamic was. I, I was struck by the fact that there were some really generous people who were highly energized and others were exhausted. Yeah. And, you know, I, I had been on both sides of that and really wanted to understand the difference. And you know, the, the research I went on to do kind of has, has been really useful in my own life. Uh, you know, I found that one of the, the easiest ways to burn yourself out and, and go through that kind of uh, caregiver fatigue is to sacrifice yourself for others and say, look, I'm, you know, I'm going to put other people first. And I'm going to neglect my own priorities and well-being, uh, which is a recipe for disaster. Uh, and what I saw with with really successful givers was they had ambitions for how they wanted to help others, but they also realized they needed to <laughs> to exercise self-care. And so I've tried to become more thoughtful about the helping I do and and make choices around who I help and and when I help and how I help that you know that that hopefully allow me to be supportive of others, but not do it at a major personal cost. You're on the board of uh, the Lean In Foundation, a, a very big, almost like a, a movement around just leaning in and not putting yourself first, isn't it? Like, how do you reconcile what you just said <laughs> with telling people to lean in, which it almost seems like self-sacrifice? I think a lot of it depends on you know how people define lean in, and there are definitely as many definitions of it as there are people who use the term. Okay. Um, when you know when Sheryl Sandberg coined the term, what she was trying to encourage women to do in particular was to not lean back and say, look, you know, you you may feel like there are societal expectations or stereotypes that say women are supposed to be caring and communal, uh, but it's actually okay for women to be ambitious. And so, you know, if there are leadership roles that you want to pursue, if there are ways that, that you know, that you would like to step up, uh, you know, don't, don't self-limit. And I think that, you know, I think that's an, it's a particularly interesting and important message uh, you know, from from a gender perspective, because the evidence is pretty clear that that women are more prone to burnout at work than men are. Yeah, uh, I'm sure I'm sure you've seen it, Dave. But women are more likely to get stuck with with the office housework, uh, where they basically get voluntold uh, to you know to take <laughs> notes in meetings, to to organize events, and they do all this extra work that's sort of invisible, unnoticed, and not rewarded. And not only that, they they get penalized more if they say no. Uh, because they're they're sort of expected to do it, uh, and they get taken for granted. Then, if if they say yes, and so it's it's a big double bind. And I think we, you know, we, I think we all have a personal responsibility and and also an organizational responsibility to distribute that workload much more fairly. I think a contributing factor to that is that at home, uh, still women do a lot more of the household work. I've seen a bunch of surveys about that. So like you've got a heavier load at home and then you're getting some of the stuff at, at work. So I, I would, I would totally support you there. And if, uh, if what Cheryl means with her you know, lean in philosophy is, is more of that, you know, stand up and, you know, don't give in that, that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, and that, that is in alignment with what you're talking about is, you know, serving others, but not doing it to the extent that you get rid of self-care. Yeah, I think that's so important. And one of the, when I was, when I was working on Give and Take, I, you know, I kind of went on a, uh, I guess I was, I was kind of searching the world to find examples of people who had ways of helping others that didn't require total self-sacrifice. And one of my favorites came from a, an entrepreneur named Adam Rifkin, who said, you know, what I've, what I've learned over time is I just need to do more five-minute favors. And Adam's been a, a super successful entrepreneur. He started three companies uh, that uh, that he sold and 
was able to retire in his 30s and uh, yet was known as this extremely generous guy along the way. And he said, look, you know, I think the mistake that a lot of people make is they feel pressure to be Mother Teresa or Gandhi. When in fact, you know, you can often make these micro loans of your time or your skills or your connections to others. And so I think one thing that a lot of us can do is, is say, all right, you know, I could probably do a few more five minute favors each week. And, you know, sometimes that's as simple as making an introduction between two people who could benefit from knowing each other. It might be sharing a bit of knowledge. Hey, here's, you know, here's an article that I think might might have some insight on the question you pose. It could be going out of your way to recognize somebody whose work has gone unnoticed uh, I love one thing I, I learned from my mom on the on the giving side is uh, when somebody provides really great customer service, uh, she would always write a, a letter to their boss, uh, you know, going out of her way to recognize them. And I, I think that's an amazing example of a five minute favor. Uh, I love that. that. That's such a powerful thing. And it it does feel hard. I'm I'm at a point now where I get masses of of people you know who want the the five minute <laughs> five minute favor enough that it would be multiple lifetimes probably every month if I you know listen to everything but I also have a sincere desire to help so I've I've had to become much more conscious of, of how I do that I've asked my assistants to help me uh, filter those so that when I do have you know five minutes to help I'm doing the, the most I can is that idea of sort of outsourcing the filtering to decide which five minute favors to do. Is that something that works? Is that something that you've seen among successful people? I guess, I guess it depends who you outsource it to, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think the, you know, in general it's helpful because there's a, there's a bunch of research suggesting that we actually give better advice to others than we take for ourselves. Uh, and you know, every, every time I, I mention that when I'm teaching, uh, my students laugh, laugh uncomfortably and I realize, oh, they're, 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 maybe, maybe I'm doing it right now. <laughs> but I think that what, one of the mistakes we make is when we try to make our own decisions, uh, we get stuck in the weeds and we think about, okay, you know, what, what, what would be, you know, an appropriate response right now? How do I make sure that I, you know, really bend over backward to help this person? Whereas when we make decisions for other people, we're much more likely to take a step back and consider the big picture and say, okay, yeah, wait a minute, every, every yes that Dave says uh, is going to be a no to somebody else. And so if, if we can say no to the following five requests, we're actually freeing up his time to, you know, to, to engage with people where he can contribute in the most meaningful and unique ways. And so I think you know, having somebody to take that 30,000 foot view who knows your priorities uh, and is able to help you sort through them uh, is immensely helpful. How do the people that you've seen in your research uh, and in your teaching and your books, your TED Talks and everything, I mean, you've, you've studied this more than anyone else I know. How do the people who uh, who say no avoid the, the backlash from people? Because I've found that as I become just higher level and, and busier with Bulletproof and writing books and podcasts and, and doing what I do to, to move the needle, um, there's a bunch of people who sort of feel like I didn't get my five minutes. I feel abandoned. It triggers childhood stuff for them. And, and they, they sort of get, you know, a little bit bitter, for lack of a better word. So how do you see leaders and people who are going out and designing meaningful, li meaningful lives and meaningful jobs and all those things? How, how are they solving that problem? Because I haven't solved it yet. <laughs> I think neither have I. Uh, <laughs> okay, I it's, darn. A, it's, an it's an ongoing struggle. But I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I have found most useful is as I've studied this and as you know, I've observed a lot of different people trying to deal with it, um, I think the first thing is it is way easier to say no if, uh, if you're offering something else still in return. Uh, so you know, I'll frequently, when, when somebody reaches out and I just don't, I don't have enough room in my calendar to, to add another meeting, uh, what I'll write back is I'll say, you know, if I could be helpful by email, I'm happy to. Uh, you know, often people will, <laughs> I get asked a lot as an organizational psychologist for career advice. And I don't even feel comfortable giving career advice to, to students I've had for a whole semester in class, <laughs> uh, let, you know, let alone to a complete stranger. And so what I'll often do is write back and say, look, you know, I, I, I actually, you know, I can't give tailored advice to, to people I haven't gotten to know really well. Um, but here are the, you know, the few books that I've, I've read on the topic that I think are especially helpful. Um, and then also, you know, if, if I can weigh in on any questions about studies in worker psychology that might be relevant or if I can suggest, you know, people in a particular industry that you're thinking about who, you know, who have gone on record thinking about this in, you know, in an interesting way, let me know. And then it doesn't feel like a no, right? It feels like a, hey, wait, here's, here's a different way that I could, I could try to be helpful. 
Uh, and I think that that sometimes makes a difference. Have you have you done any of that? Some sometimes, uh, and it it's a it's really a question of judgment and and time. And I get a lot of requests from you know CEOs, people, some people I, I know you know pretty well, not close friends, but but people I really like and respect and have spent uh, several hours with, saying, hey, could you just sit down for an hour and help me crack my health? problems. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> a, it's probably going to take more than an hour. And B, I have all of my available free hours are allocated for my family right now because I'm traveling an insane amount for Bulletproof. And like, I, I've got to get the kid time and you know the, the husband time. And, and so you, know, you can tell them that and, and some people respect it. But what I ended up doing was I, I put together that you know, this is the, the CEO only kind of insider's guide to what I actually do. Uh, as an executive, that's different than what I do as you know a, a, a normal human being with normal requirements. Because a, a pro athlete is going to have one set of things, and um, there's just a, a different cognitive and attention load that I find for for executives is, is different. So I'm like, here's here's my notes on that, and I'll do things like that. But it's um, it, it's a constant challenge, just like like you're saying, and and it's it's born out of my desire to you know, be of service to as many people as I can and not burn out along the way. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I think the the biggest mistake that I've made personally is I've, you know, I've wanted to say yes as often as possible. Mm -hmm. And I found, yeah, I've always liked to be the person who under promises and over delivers. And I've, you know, and from time to time, I've found myself in situations where I'm doing the opposite. And so, you know, I hate this feeling of saying yes and then coming back and saying, just kidding. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I can't. I can't do it. And so I've, you know, what I've tried to remember is it's it's much better to just let people down gently uh, up front than it is to disappoint them after agreeing. And so I think the, you know, the I guess the the advice I'd give to anybody who's who's busy and having trouble saying no is just to say, look, it's it's much kinder actually to give a swift no than it is to say yes and then drop the ball later. Oh yeah, it. It's much higher integrity to do that. And the one nuance there it, that earlier in my career, I would say, I'm sorry, I can't do that, which is always a lie. And that's in my new book, Game Changers, about weasel words. And here's the deal. If you say, I'm not going to do that, surprisingly, the person who hears that usually feels more honored because you were truthful with them versus if you said, I can't do that, when they're like, actually, you you could. You just, you don't want to. And then they make up a story about why you don't want to. And you're like, hey, I'm 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 not going to do that. Um, I'm working on some other stuff. And I, I just found that I got a, I got a more positive response and probably more respect from just being really truthful. Like, you know, would love to, won't. <laughs> what do you think about that? I've definitely found that as well. Uh, it may just be a Wharton thing, but <laughs> 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 which you can relate to. But I think that, you know, every once in a while, there's, there's somebody who just will not take no for an answer. And, you know, you start out with a very polite no, and then they ask again and a second time and a third and a fourth. And and I had this happen a couple of years ago where uh, somebody was was asking to uh, to meet and the the request was completely outside of my expertise. Uh, I, I mean, I could, I could not be more irrelevant or unqualified to weigh in. And so I, I just finally wrote back and said, you know, I, I I'm, I've been trying really hard to get better at saying no. Thanks for the practice. <laughs> That's, and he went away. It that was, is way more I, I was nuanced. shocked. Uh, on, my, <laughs> on my Wharton uh, kind of a c- senior trip, like when, when we were graduating, um, we went to China. And I'm a six foot four white guy. And so as I'm walking through uh, the streets of, of one city or another, the people want to sell you stuff on the street. They, they see me from blocks away because I stick out above everyone else and they sort of come running. And sometimes there's five or 10 people trying to sell me stuff. And I learned how to say in Chinese, how to say, no, thank you. No, no. And how to say sort of the impolite no. And I had this one guy who just followed me for 10 blocks trying to sell me some statue. I just did. I was never going to buy and he couldn't take no for an answer. So wow. finally I, I looked at my friend and, and I said, I said, tell me how to say, I will kick your ass. <laughs> in Chinese, right? So oh, I, no. uh, and, and, and so of course my friend starts laughing and she's like, Dave, okay. And she teaches me. So I turn around to the guy and I said it, I wish I remembered how to say it. And, uh, and, and he looks at me suddenly like this look of like, really? And then like, like said something and, and went away. And, and I said, what did he say? And after she got off the ground laughing, uh, she said, he, he said, you don't have to be a barbarian about it. And 
<laughs> what I realized was my ability to communicate no <laughs> in Chinese was pretty crappy, right? So sometimes it was about the nuance of, of how you say it, but sometimes, like I said, there's someone who's, they don't want to hear it. Um, so I, uh, I don't know, you just brought up that story for me because we're talking about Warden. That's so funny. Well, it sounds like you, uh, you got what you deserved there. <laughs> I, I did. It was, it was funny. And I did not buy the statue for, for the record. Now, you talk about something that I think listeners would love to know more about. You talk about job design and meaningful work. And I think when you're starting out in your career, I mean, you have the advantage of your Wharton professor. I got to go to an Ivy League school and I had a, a good start in my career, which makes it easier now for me to say, I'm going to design my job. I'm a CEO. Um, but how do you, when you're getting going, you know, you're okay. I'm, I'm a barista, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just building up my career how do people make it meaningful as they accumulate the power and the skills uh, and the experience in order to go out and say, I, I want to design my job? Or do we just have to suffer for a while? No, I think you, you've you already highlighted the first point, which is, you know, oftentimes you get much more latitude to to tinker with your own job once you've proven your contribution. Uh, I, you know, I, I have a, I have a lot of uh, students who take on entry level jobs and they want to know right away, okay, how can I turn this job into my passion? Uh, and the answer is you need to be just awesome at your job first, right? You need to excel at the assigned tasks you were given before you can suddenly say, well, I want to, I want to reinvent what my role is here. And there's, there's a whole bunch of research showing, uh, this dates back over half a century that when, um, when, when you stand out in your job and, uh, especially when you exceed expectations, uh, you, you earn what, what get called idiosyncrasy credits, uh, which is, you know, basically the latitude to deviate from expectations and do things a little bit differently. And so I think that's, that's the first step. I think the second step, this comes from research that my colleagues Amy Resneski and Jane Dutton did on, on job crafting, is to say, look, there are very few, few jobs that were actually designed personally for you. Mm -hmm. uh, when, you know, when somebody writes a job description, uh, it's, it's made to be a kind of one size fits all. And so you do want to customize your job or, or become a, a bit of an architect of it and one way you can do that is you can go and uh, approach a couple people who might be more senior you, than you in the organization and ask them if they have any problems that they need solved. Or, you know, if they have any advice on how you can take a set of skills or strengths you think you have uh, and make them useful to the organization. And if you ask enough people that question, uh, you start to, you know, get invitations to work on a side project, uh, to get involved in a team that you weren't currently part of. And uh, you know, if your if your input is valuable there, then then you get to do more of that kind of work over time. There's one of my favorite books that no one's read uh, about brains is called On Intelligence, and this is from the guy who was a creator of the Palm Pilot, like the first uh, early, early, early ancestor uh, of what's today an iPhone, uh, or at least a smartphone. And he talks about pattern matching and filtering in the book and, and what are brains? Oh, this is the, the Jeff Hawkins book. Yes. The Jeff Hawkins, you've read it. I, I you know what? It's, it's been a while, but go okay. on. Okay. It is the Jeff Hawkins book. Uh, I actually used to work at uh three com when we acquired Palm pilot. So, uh, I, I briefly met him and Donna Dubinsky and all. Um, and what, what I learned from that book is that our brains are pattern matching machines and we predict the future microseconds in advance. And, we only notice things that don't match our prediction. <laughs> so I knew you were going to say that. It, well, there you go. You predicted it. I love it. <laughs> You're psychic, man. Uh, uh, but you noticed, so maybe no. Uh, but what, <laughs> what's happening as as an employer? You know, someone who's working with a boss or with partners or even employees. If you do what they expect you're going to actually uh, not necessarily be noticed. And if you screw it up, they're going to notice and it's not going to be a good thing. But if you stand out because you did it very well, and I mean the, 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 the lowest level jobs. I mean, if you're in the back of the kitchen doing dishes and you you show up on time, you're reliable, you know, you, and you just, you show a duty of care, you stack things, right. And you just, you have this attitude. It stands out because it's not necessarily what your boss would have, uh, would have expected. And it's that, that little desire for excellence that I think triggers your growth in your in your career and gives you that opportunity to work into designing your job. Do you like that theory? I mean, does that match your experience of of teaching this and, and experiencing it? It does uh, in a really interesting way. So the the research I mentioned earlier on job crafting, 
uh, kind of one of the points it makes is that we're all active job crafters. And, you know, there are small changes that we make every day, you know, kind of adding a task here, uh, maybe delegating something that we're, we're not that interested in or where somebody more junior than us might, might benefit from trying it out. Uh, you know, maybe interacting with a certain person that we really enjoy uh, more than the job required or <laughs> trying to avoid an interaction with a really unpleasant person. And those are all tiny moments of job crafting. And what I've gotten really interested in is, is how do you do that at scale? And so one of the, one of the things I did last year uh, when, I, when I started my work-life podcast with Ted was I said, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into some workplaces that take some of these ideas to the extreme and try to figure out what the rest of us can learn from them. And one of those workplaces was a tomato paste plant called Morningstar, where uh, they have operated successfully for three decades. Uh, they bring in hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue, and they've never had a single boss, uh, which you know is kind of crazy and way, way before holacracy. Um, so I was, I was just interested in, you know, there, there are probably some practice that, practices they have that, that I would not apply to my work life, but <laughs> are there things they do that might be relevant? And my, my favorite takeaway from Morningstar, which, you know, accounts for a huge amount of the, the tomato paste in the U.S. So one of the things they, they do is they say, look, you know, it's, it, it's, it's hard to give everybody the freedom to invent their own job, uh, which, you know, could quickly devolve into chaos if, you know, if nobody has a boss. And so what they do is at the beginning of, of each year, they ask people to write a letter describing the job that they want to do this year. And it's amazing to have that freedom, but they want to make sure it aligns with the organizational mission. And so you have to make a case in your letter for how the job that you want to do is going to advance the organization's goals. And then you have to take that letter to the five or 10 people who you work with most clo closely and get their buy-in. Wow. And then they all do the same thing. And I just, I came away thinking, I'm going to do this in every team I'm part of because one, I want people to know what I think my contribution is. Two, I want to know what they want to do. Uh, and then three, if we get aligned on that, it's a lot easier then to make sure that all of the key roles are covered and, and everybody's adding value. It's almost related to what Ray Dalio just wrote about in his sort of operating system for companies book, uh, where he, he talks about believability and where if you know these are the areas where you really truly add value and, and these are the areas where you're sort of average and these are the areas where you have nothing to say, uh, if you know that and you communicate it with other people uh, and they agree with it, then all of a sudden they can better use you and you can just show up at the right the right time in the right meetings in the right way uh, and not sort of sit in the meeting and say, I know nothing about this topic, but I'm supposed to be here, therefore I'm there. Yeah, I, uh, I've spent a bunch of time inside Bridgewater and I think the, the biggest thing that I've learned from Ray uh, on that front at least is I really never thought about about weighting people's input by believability before. I thought, okay, you know, the, the way to be an empowering leader uh, is to, to hear everybody's voices. And, and I remember Ray just kind of saying, well, that, that's a bunch of baloney because, you know, not all voices are equally valid. And you don't want to run a democracy in a company. You want to try to become a meritocracy. And, and yet most companies don't get there. Because, you know, they're, they're too busy paying attention to, you know, the most powerful person in the room uh, or the person with the most seniority or, t or, you know, tenure, as opposed to the person who has the best idea. And so if we can get, if we can find out who has credibility in, in each domain that we're making decisions in, we can give those people's opinions more weight in those domains. And I have, uh, I have tried to, what, what I've tried to do on that is, uh, is now when I work with, with teams, uh, instead of saying, look, who's in charge of this team? I want to know who has the best expertise on each issue uh, and let them drive the conversation on that issue or better yet, uh, let them frame the conversation uh, and then, you know, hear from everybody else. Uh, it's a it's a powerful way to to look at things. And I didn't know I was doing this, but as I became a, a what's now a professional biohacker, uh, when I was looking at how do I lose my hundred pounds? How do I uh, recover my health and then how do I do more with my biology than you're supposed to, uh, I realized that there's a huge number in the medical industry, a huge number of people with differing opinions. And I eventually developed a filter of believability for someone who's in a medical profession and healing profession. So you look at it not as a skeptic, but just as, okay, what have you actually done? And you know, are you following the same script as everyone else? In which case, 
basically Google replaced you, or do you have some special believable skill where you, you could demonstrate it? And I even apply that to, do I interview someone on Bulletproof Radio? It, it, it's all about believability. And if you're going to take input, I, I learned a lot from, from that. And it, it sounds like you're, you're sort of saying, as a piece of advice for people listening, is you know, become believable in an area and make sure people know what that area is, and, and that can help you stand out. What's interesting about that is I think that sometimes when people become successful in a domain, they overestimate how believable they are in other domains. Yeah, uh, ego. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, I, you know, I, I, I think my my favorite example of this was uh, was Steve Jobs investing in the Segway uh, and predicting it was, you know, going to be to the car what the car was to the horse and buggy, more or less. Uh, you know, and and granted, Jobs knew a lot about computers and uh, a lot about movies and ultimately a lot about uh, a whole bunch of technology. But most of his expertise was uh, was more in the software world than the hardware world. He certainly had not had any experience in you know in the the transportation world at all. And I think what what happens often is people they achieve some success and then they learn to trust their gut and they say, all right, look, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna make decisions based on my intuition. And I think that's incredibly dangerous. I think you know you don't want to follow your intuition. You want to test your intuition. And if you break down where intuition actually comes from, uh, intuition is just subconscious pattern recognition. Yes. Right? And so what you want to ask then is, okay, all the experience I've had that leads me to recognize patterns, uh, are those patterns diagnostic of, you know, for the situation that I'm in right now? And it may well be that the patterns of the past or the patterns of one world that you've been a part of are terrible predictors of the current one or of the future. <laughs> So, I'm a, a computer hacker, tech, uh, horizontal scalability cloud computing expert, and I run a coffee company, right? And human performance, and we're more than coffee, but I had to really get comfortable with the fact that I know how to make a really good cup of coffee and dissect this, but I don't know this industry at all. And Bulletproof has been really successful, I think in part because I, at least I'm telling myself that I've done a reasonably good job of saying, I don't know anything about most of this, so I better hire really smart people. I uh, I would like to see more leaders <laughs> recognize where they don't know anything uh, and they re- need to surround themselves with people who do. I think this is, you know, th- there's always a, th- well, not I shouldn't say always, so I'll say that differently. I think there's, there's frequently a trade-off between expertise and, and creativity here. Uh, there's some research on, on what's called cognitive entrenchment, uh, which shows that the deeper your expertise goes in a field, the more you start to take for granted assumptions that ought to be questioned. Mm. And, you know, I think that that's one of the reasons we see so much disruption from the outside as opposed to the inside. Uh, because, you know, you've seen this in the tech world over and over again. The, the incumbents, the incumbents are, are basically operating on assumptions that, that don't apply to the, the world as it exists. Uh, they were built in a different world. And so it's way easier to see that if you're kind of a novice from the outside and say, wait a minute. Like what, who, why do we believe that a video has to be rented physically? <laughs> why can't we just watch it, you know, on a computer? Uh, why, why do we believe that you can only make money selling film? What if we had a digital camera? Uh, and, you know, I think those, those insights, uh, the funny thing is like you see those insights bubble up at places like Blockbuster and Kodak. Uh, and then they fail to act on them. And it's outsiders who are much more likely to, to run with them. Now, you actually wrote a book called Originals, How Nonconformists Move the World. And you just talked about you know, Steve Jobs and, and people like that. Uh, but if everyone's a nonconformist, everyone's working to stand out and make their job uh, designed for their own skills and believability and, and things like that, how do, we, how do we sort that out? I mean, there's, there's billions and billions of people on the planet is there really a hope for that? Or should you just raise your hand and say, I'm not a nonconformist. I'm just you know, I'm going to find something that I love and just go with it. How does, how does that work if everyone's trying to follow the same algorithm? That's a really good question. Uh, I have to say, I, I don't worry about that a ton because, you know, if you, if you were to draw a curve and on, on one side of the curve, you have too much originality. And on the other side of the curve, you have too little. I think most workplaces are in the too little realm. Uh, I think you know there, there's evidence, for example, that 
if you ask people about their best idea, uh, their boldest suggestion they've ever had at work, their most promising creative direction, uh, you see that that over 80% of people never did anything about it. Uh, most of them didn't even speak up. And some of that is because of fear. More often, though, it's because of futility. You know, even, even if nothing bad is going to happen to me if I speak up, I just don't believe that anybody's going to take my idea seriously or, you know, want to run with it. And so why bother to try? And I think because of that, we lose out on so many valuable ideas. And, you know, I've I experienced this personally. I was uh, I had the, the great fortune of uh, co-founding what our student newspaper called Harvard's first online social network in 1999. <laughs> uh, I had... Uh, you know, at the time, America Online was big, and a couple of uh, of classmates and I had started searching profiles to see if we could find other people who were going to be in our class uh, when we were high school seniors. And it eventually turned into a big email list. And by the time we arrived on campus, we had connected over an eighth of the, the entering class. And then we we got there, and we said, "Well, now we we know each other face to face, and we're all in Cambridge. Why do we need the online social network?" And we shut it down. <laughs> And five years later, Mark starts Facebook and what turned out to be the house next door to mine. Uh, so, you know, I think I think many of us have been in that position of, of having an idea that had real potential and either being afraid to pursue it or not, you know, not thinking it would go anywhere and not seeing the potential. And, you know, I, I think that's a missed opportunity for a lot of people. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying we should all always be nonconformists. Uh, what I am saying, though, is that I think most organizations are conformity machines, Right. They're, they're designed to stamp out original thinking. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that it's so common for organizations to go out of business. And so I want to figure out, you know, if, if you're an, an individual with creative ideas, how do you champion them effectively? And then if you're a leader, how do you build a culture that welcomes original ideas and then, you know, makes them a reality? I, I really like that. I really like that perspective. You said something on social media recently, you said productivity isn't a virtue. It's a means to an end. It's only virtuous if the end is worthy. Don't worship at the altar of hustle. Don't boast about grit. Strive to be productive in generosity, creativity, and integrity. Now, here's the question. Does Gary V have a price on your head? <laughs> you know, I had, uh, <laughs> I, I got it. I got a really funny text from Gary a few months ago, uh, and I'll, I'll answer your question in a second. But this, I think, this context will will help to to make sense of of my response. So, uh, I got a text out of the blue from him, uh, which said, uh, basically, he said, uh, "Hey, how can how can I be helpful to you?" And I was like, uh, "Oh, hey, Gary, <laughs> why do you ask? You know, out of out of the blue." And he said, well, you know, you, I support winners and you're a winner, not just in business, but as a man. And I, I wrote back and I said, thank you. No one's ever called me a man before. <laughs> I like Gary. He, he was I on do the show. Too. I, He's funny. <laughs> I think I, I find him hilarious. And, you know, I think that, that Gary often captures attention uh, by, you know, pushing ideas to their extreme and, you know, kind of uh, painting caricatures, right? And so I think one... One perversion of uh, of Gary's philosophy is there are people out there who belong to a cult of hustle mm -hmm. and think that it's just it's a good thing inherently it's virtuous to be a hard worker and I think it's important to take a step back and say well doesn't it depend on what you're working toward uh, I don't I don't see any virtue for example in becoming like the the I guess the the like the the king or queen of Mar of Marie Kondo. <laughs> right. Like if, if, if you have if you have mastered the process of, you know, of decluttering your house and no one else lives in your house, I don't consider that a virtue. Right. What's what's the benefit to others? Uh, how does this matter for anyone beyond you? And so, you know, my, my point was just to say, look, you know, we before we, you know, we get obsessed with with hustling or, you know, being gritty, uh, we should think about whether the goals we're pursuing really matter and then try to take that work ethic that, you know, that is so valuable in any line of work uh, and apply it to something that really counts. And uh, I've not heard from Gary on that particular tweet, but uh, I, I think I'm going to send it to him and, and see if it makes him angry. I think <laughs> I, he might agree. I think he might agree with it, actually. I, I think he might. I, I mean, he, he, he really talks about long term view and some of this, you know, one of his, his quotes is, you know, you eat you eat crap for, for 18 months to eat caviar for years. And sort of, you know, sometimes you have to have enough grit 
to push that new nonconformist idea past the the naysayers and things and and there's some resilience in there but i i would i honestly believe that hard work is uh is not a virtue at all i'm a computer scientist and i can tell you that if i can get the job done with five percent load on my cpu it's elegant and if i can get the job done with a hundred percent load on my cpu then i'm a bad programmer <laughs> so if if i'm a programmer of my life and of my effort uh, working hard is only of merit when you're working hard with the highest possible efficiency. And I just find that I spent a lot of my life wasting so much effort that for me, the highest virtue is laziness, where laziness, <laughs> it, it's defined as I spent the minimum necessary time and energy achieving the goal, which freed up energy that I could use to become a better human being, to help other people, to be a better dad. Uh, but just working hard for the sake of working hard, it, it's, it seems like environmentally wasteful if the environment is the time you have here on earth. Oh, that's such a, it's such a, an interesting metaphor uh, for, for capturing it. I think, I, I think that in some ways this, this whole hustle culture is why people are overworked. Uh, you know, you, you have, you have lots of leaders who have built, you know, kind of work hard, play hard cultures and said, look, you can only, you can only be successful if you work 70, 80, 90 hours a week. And I look at that and I say, okay, look, there are some tasks where the learning curve uh, is really steep, and you know, if you work those, if you work more hours, you probably, if you know, if your if if your learning techniques are good, uh, you'll probably climb up that curve faster. Uh, there are definitely some periods of urgency uh, in any project where you know where you have to drop everything and and work, but you know, if <laughs> if I'm hiring. I want to hire the person who can get the job done just as well in fewer hours and finds a better way to do it. Uh, and I never would have called that laziness, <laughs> but I think the underlying <laughs> the underlying philosophy resonates because I think that uh, you know it's it's interesting. Like Darwin, uh, I think he he sort of changed the world working four hours a day. Uh, most of the great writers I know uh, have a standard routine where they write three, two to three hours a day, and that's their their total writing workload for the day. And, uh, you know, I think that, again, not every job, not every project, uh, but I think we put too much emphasis on inputs when what really matter are the outputs. I remember uh, right after I graduated from business school, I went to New York and visited a friend who was working at a big investment bank. And she's like, okay, I think I have time to have dinner with you. We can get 45 minutes at 7.30 at night on a Thursday. I'm like, really, why is this so busy? And she said, oh, I gotta be back in the office. And at dinner, she said, you know, some of my colleagues, like the the managing directors, they actually put out a newspaper and reading glasses and leave the light in light on in their office uh, when they leave. Oh, so, and and it was this whole point of where being seen working hard was a virtue, and that was how you got ahead. And and I was just thinking to myself, like I couldn't handle this because I want someone who has the highest possible returns in the entire time they're sailing a yacht around the world. Like that's my guy. Uh, because they automated everything, so they didn't have to work. And uh, maybe this is just you know the the rise of AI and machine intelligence. But if you go back through history, one of the biggest commercial trade wars ever was around baking powder because it freed up so many women from the drudgery of waiting for bread to rise to feed their family. <laughs> and so when that came out, it was such a massive way of enhancing laziness or wow. the flip side is freeing up time. And like, I, I just want more time to be with my kids. I want more time to have meaningful conversations with someone who you know, really they're stuck and they can't lose that hundred pounds or whatever it is. That matters more than working hard. And I just wish that we could get that out there into the world a little bit more. It, um, it, do you have a person who, who best embodies that value uh, that, that you, you've interviewed or interacted with? Like, like who's the leader in being strategically lazy? <laughs> well, I'm not sure if, if, if they'll consider it a compliment <laughs> put that way, but you know, I, I think, well, I, I think about this at the individual level and then at the, you know, the, the organizational level too. So uh, individually, I, you know, I think it's hard to argue with, uh, with Cal Newport is a really good example. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with his book, Deep Work, and mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's very disciplined about saying, look, here are the, the goals I want to achieve. Uh, here, you know, here are the most effective and efficient ways to work toward them. And, you know, I'm just not going to waste my time on, on things that are irrelevant just because I live in a culture that, you know, that glorifies busyness. Um, 
I think organizationally, uh, Leslie Perlow wrote a, a great book uh, called Sleeping With Your Smartphone, mm-hmm. uh, where she worked with a bunch of companies and ran experiments to figure out how to, you know, how to get people to use their time more efficiently. And one of one of my favorite practices that that she tested at a consulting firm, uh, and then uh, and also at a um, at a software company, was uh, she set quiet time policies. Uh, so one version of this uh, with software engineers was no interruptions Tuesday, Thursday, Friday before noon. Wow. And they ended up launching their their product on time for, I think it was the second time in division history. Uh, 66% of engineers showed above average productivity. And, you know, what was going on is before when there were interruptions, people were, they had a really hard time getting into deep work. They couldn't get into a state of flow. They were constantly being distracted and having to kind of go back to the beginning of a project as opposed to continuing from where they left off. And also, they were repeating the same conversations over and over again when nine people had the same request. <laughs> and so, you know, you set this quiet time policy. Everybody feels more productive after that, you know, that three, four hour morning. And then in the afternoon, they have, they have time for collaborative work. They can answer all those people one time. Some of those people have figured out a better solution to their own problem. And, you know, I think it's the problem is we have a hard time sticking to those boundaries So after she finished the experiment, people started to slip. And they said, well, you know, I know we're not supposed to interrupt each other, you know, Thursday mornings. But this question was just really only taking me 12 minutes. And then, you know, an hour and a half later, you're still talking. Right. Um, I really like the other thing I really like on this is um, uh, there's a a healthcare company here in Philly called Vynamic. And the the founder, Dan Callista, uh, just said, you know what, There's, there's no reason that we need work to intrude on people's lives. And so they they set a policy that you're not allowed to send emails on nights and weekends. Uh, and you're also not allowed to check your email on nights and weekends. Uh, and, you know, I think you've, you've probably seen others like uh, like Basecamp yeah. work with similar policies. But I, I think that's a step in the right direction. We have got to set boundaries organizationally because it's, it's often too hard for people to do it individually. I do not uh, reliably check my email um, in the evenings at all. I mean, I, I might if I just feel like it, but uh, I've, I've set expectations with in my leadership team. Like, you can text me if it's really urgent, but uh, evenings and weekends don't expect me to check my email before I go to bed. Uh, it's just, it's not going to happen. That's the kind of example we need more leaders to set, right? Cause I think too often leaders are always on and they're responding and, you know, they're trying to model that they're available or that they're committed. Uh, but that just sets a tone that everybody else has to be constantly reachable. The first three or four years of Bulletproof, I, I'm a night owl. I, I, I was working every night until two in the morning because I had a day job <laughs> when I was starting Bulletproof. <laughs> <laughs> I was a VP at a big company. Uh, and uh, so that did set that tone where, where people are feeling like they have to keep up. And most people need more sleep than I do where, with where I am now. And, and like I just realized I don't want to train my people to do that. We, we all care, so we work hard. Well, the... The day job thing is interesting too. I have I, I've heard so many venture capitalists say I would never invest in entrepreneur. Yeah, I I, would, I just wouldn't back an entrepreneur who's you know who's who's only doing this as a side gig. You need to be all in, and you will be pleased to know, but not at all surprised from your experience that there was a nationally representative study of of American entrepreneurs which showed that the ones who kept their day job and started their companies as a hobby we're 33% less likely to fail once they went all in. <laughs> uh, mine definitely was a hobby. It was a blog to help people. Like if someone had told me this when I was 20, uh, it would have changed my life. So I'm going to tell some people. But the, uh, the 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 honest truth is I didn't have enough money to start the company. I had just moved to a new country. I didn't have a lot of savings. I'd worked it for half salary for a while. I was a sole breadwinner. I'm like, you know what? Uh, it's not an option. And so whether that means all in or you know, running in terror from you know, bankruptcy, not feeding your kids or something, like, no way. Uh, I have a job at a big company, stock options and a VP salary. I think I'm going to just roll with that and do a great job in that job and do my little side hustle until it's not on the side anymore. I think that's admirable as long as your side hustle isn't the same thing as your day hustle. There's a lot of, um, I've seen this among young people earlier in their careers where they, uh, you're like, you can't start a competitor to your day job while working your day job, it's unethical and it's probably illegal and it's going to stick to your reputation for years if you do that. Yeah, it's like conflict of interest. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to talk about power with you because you have this interesting audible audiobook called Power Moves. 
And you went to the World Economic Forum. Uh, by the way, uh, shout out to Ariana Huffington, who was speaking at the Bulletproof Conference in, in April. She has uh, she's served Bulletproof Coffee at the World Economic Forum for like three years in a row, which just blew me away. She's awesome. And uh, you interviewed uh, the CEO of Microsoft and Sheryl Sandberg and Eric Schmidt and uh, David Solomon, the CEO of Goldman Sachs. And you asked him about power. And here's my question for you. I interviewed 500 game changers, people who've been on, on the show, about most important things for performing better. And none of them looked at money, fame, or power as, as an important goal. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Well, did they, did they and not want to admit it? Yeah. Or did they and were they not aware of it? Okay, that is a very fair point. And, and my question was, you know, what are your three most important pieces of advice for people who want to perform better at everything they do as a human being? So it, it could just be that power doesn't matter for performance. Uh, and there's no question that, that power and fame and money are pleasant. Uh, and you know, some people are more, more attracted to them than others, but that they, they don't lead to happiness. Uh, they don't necessarily lead you to perform better. Uh, so it could just be with the framing of the question. But what made you decide that you were going to go after uh, you know, these powerful people and interview them? Uh, what did you want to learn? Well, you know, it was, it was interesting. I had uh, I'd been invited to, to Davos, uh, I don't know, f five, six years ago for the first time and went as a, you know, as an academic. And you know, I was just, what am I doing here? Uh, you know, they're like the, the, there are these titans of industry and heads of state, and and here I am. <laughs> and you know, after I had gone for a few years, I started to feel more, a little more comfortable. I, I had a couple of other roles uh, that you know kind of involved me more centrally, and you know, in the program and in in various activities. And I found myself at dinners with a lot of these people, and I got really interested in you know how did they acquire power? Uh, how are they you know how is it changing them? Uh, you know, as, a, as an organizational psychologist, this is this is a kind of a fundamental question in our field, right? Does power corrupt? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, especially how can we all get better at using power for good? Uh, and so, it you know, it seemed like since it's the ultimate epicenter of power, uh, it seemed like the perfect place to explore those questions. What did you learn? Well, I think the my biggest aha, uh, which is you know something I'd been reading about a little bit, uh, but I didn't I didn't realize it was going to be so central to people's experiences was I, I came away convinced that power does not corrupt. Uh, you know, I think I think it's it's tempting to believe that, and we've we've certainly seen you know some really disturbing examples of of what look like corruption in power. Um, you know, I think whether you know you're, we're going to talk about the Me Too movement or the Catholic Church, uh, you know, abuses of power are rampant. But I don't actually think power corrupts. I think what I came away believing is that power reveals on the outside what was already on the inside. Yes. It amplifies corruption. It doesn't cause corruption. Exactly. I, I was so, I, I, I was told this over and over again, right? So, you know, various people like Stuart Butterfield, the, the Slack founder, you know, he said, whether you're talking about money or power, uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't change you. It just makes you more of who you were before. Uh, and to your point about being an amplifier, you know, it kind of makes that stuff come out louder. Uh, because now you feel like you're you're free to express whatever your goals and values are, uh, whereas before you had a lot of power, you might have been more constrained. And there's a lot of psychology research that's that's pointed in that direction, which uh, you know kind of shows that if you were already a selfish taker, if you're given power, <laughs> then you stop becoming a faker, and you're like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna use power for my own gain. Whereas the more generous givers, uh, when they gain power, they, they try to use that to benefit others uh, and serve, you know, some kind of socially responsible goal. And uh, I, I ended up, you know, kind of armed with this, this perspective, going back through uh, examples of presidential corruption. And lo and behold, it turned out that there was a, uh, a presidential candidate uh, who was accused of unethical behavior and a judge threatened to disbar him in his very first trial as a lawyer. Uh, and that was Richard Nixon in 1931. <laughs> and so, you know, I think you you can see if you, if you take this perspective, you can see examples all around you of of saying, all right, if you really want to understand how power is going to affect someone, find out what their motives were before they got power. Interesting. And, you know, I guess where one of the places that took me also is to say, OK, you know, as you gain power, how does that affect the way that you look at other people? And I've always assumed that the more senior you get in your career, the better you are at judging character. 
you know, you, you have CEOs who say all the time, one of the things that makes me great is I'm, you know, I'm good at spotting talent. And I think the reality is the exact opposite. Because, you know, if you think about it, uh, when, when somebody gains power, people are really motivated to impress them. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, right? <laughs> everyone shows, so I, I'm a CEO in, in my, my day job. Everyone shows me the face that they want the CEO to see. So the camouflage levels of people around me are much higher than they are for normal people, uh, which, which even if I was the world's best at, at, uh, at, at ascertaining people's motives and things like that, I would still have to wade through the extra positioning for people. So I, yes. I fully agree with that. It's actually one of the most frustrating parts of being a leader <laughs> is that whole thing where could you just tell me the truth, but you're worried that I'm a powerful person, so you're not going to tell me what you really think. And man, it frustrates the hell out of me, but I don't know how to get around that. Is there, is there a hack for that? Well, I'd like to, I'd like to have one. I think, you know, I, obviously I think awareness is the first step, right? So I think that you're, you already kind of crossed that bridge to say, all right, look, you know, I, I know that as much as I'd like to believe my judgment is getting better, uh, you know, the, the information I'm getting is, you know, is less believable. And so, you know, I've, I've got to recognize that I'm probably worse at judging character now than I was before. Um, I think, in, you know, in terms of hacks, I think the best thing is to, to deprioritize your own judgment and not rely so much on your own impressions of people. So, you know, it's like when I've studied givers and takers, uh, the takers are really good fakers upward, but then they realize, gosh, it's a lot of work to pretend to care about everybody. <laughs> and so they let their guard down with their peers and subordinates who get to see more of their true colors. And that means, you know, if, if somebody has a great reputation upward, but it's more mixed lateral and downward, that can be a red flag. It means you probably want to do your reference checks, uh, you know, from people who worked side by side or below the, the people you're thinking about hiring. And, you know, I think I hear often, well, but I, I can't get an honest reference. They're all, they're all glowing and positive. And I, I think we can if we ask better questions. One of, one of my favorite questions or, or ways of asking a question is just to say, hey, um, you know, when you think about this candidate, uh, what's more likely? Uh, a, little bit too, um, a little bit too self-sacrificing? or occasionally a little bit selfish, too independent, too collaborative. You can do this for, you know, for any force choice. And if you set them up right, references do not know what the right answer is because they, they both sound like undesirable traits. And so they, they tend to give you the, the real answer, so to speak. So, so you run a full conjoint analysis. That's actually brilliant. I, you know, I never thought about it as a, as a conjoint, but I think that's exactly what it is. That is that is a serious hack. Just for people listening to the show, holy crap. I wish someone had told me that before. I'm going to start doing that. So Dave, are you, uh, are you more likely? No, I'm just kidding. Go on. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Turn the tables because, well, you have, you have your, your work life podcast with Ted, which is, you do get to turn the tables uh, and interview people a lot. What's the most unusual professional you've ever interviewed for your show? Oh, it was, it was definitely at Bridgewater. Uh, so I did a, I did an episode last season on how to love criticism, uh, where I, uh, I talked with Ray Dalio a bunch, uh, having done some research there. Uh, but one of the things I asked was of everybody who works at Bridgewater and who's ever been here, who is the best at, you know, at, at really dealing with, with the harshest possible negative feedback that you can imagine. And I was introduced to a manager there named Kieran Rao, who uh, arrived at a meeting one day. Uh, there were a couple hundred managers there and a slide went up and it showed the ratings of managers, uh, but they were displayed as a ranking. Uh, so you could see who the best managers were all the way down to the worst. And Kieran was the number one worst manager at all of Bridgewater. Oh, damn. Can you, can you imagine walking into that room with all of your peers and a slide goes up and they're like, Dave, you are the worst boss at our company. And you know, I, I look at that and I, I'd want to run away screaming uh, or quit immediately. Kieran told me it was one of the best days of his career. And uh, he learned a ton from it. And I grilled him really hard on it and ended up convinced that he actually enjoyed it. And I think if he could learn to love criticism like that, we could all become a little bit more open. And one of the, you know, one of the simple things that I, I learned from him uh, that I have applied over and over again is uh, the, the language that I put it in uh, is... You've got, we all have two selves, right? There's the proving self and the, the improving self. And what I, what I try to ask myself when, whenever somebody criticizes me now is, okay, what, it, what, would, what would Kieran say here? 
He would say, what's my goal? You know, am I trying to prove myself to this person or do I want to improve myself? And the reality is if somebody is criticizing you, you can't prove yourself, right? They've already decided that whatever you did sucked. And so you could, the best thing you can do then is say, all right, how do I take this as an opportunity to improve? And there's a, there's a great description of this that, that Doug, uh, Doug Stone and Sheila Heen have given in their book, Thanks for the Feedback. Uh, they say to think about it as giving yourself a second score. Uh, which I now do all the time. So, you know, let's uh, let's say that you know that Kieran got uh, he got a D minus for his performance as a manager. Uh, he can't change that score, right? That score has already been established. The best thing he can do is say, "All right, I want to get an A plus for how I take that D minus." And gosh, I think that's a skill everyone could use. Uh, yeah, it comes down to: Do you want to be right or do you want to be better? And yes, being right in the face of a critic. But there's a CEO power thing that, that comes into this as well. I I had I, I actually have uh, four different companies, but my I'm, I'm only CEO of one you know, bulletproof. And an employee at one of the other companies came in uh, as uh, as they were leaving and, and basically said, you know, here's here's all my complaints, and and I'm like, thank you so much for the feedback. And they looked at me and said. I can't tell if you're being truthful or not. And I said, what do you mean? And the, the whole point was, was they didn't expect the, the thank you. I think they expected defensiveness. And so then it was this weird sort of distrustful thing where like, look, the person's leaving. I just wanted to know what was up. Uh, so, so as leaders uh, and just as, as people in general, when we're hearing negative feedback or criticism or something like that, what's the best way to signal to the person delivering it that it was heard and that it was safe for them to do that? Well, I think I think you already started the you know the ideal response, which is to say thank you. I, you know, I think we all feel the temptation to <laughs> to get defensive. Uh, there's uh, there's a psychologist years ago who wrote about the idea that. We actually, um, we kind of all have a totalitarian ego. Uh, you know, imagine there's a kind of a miniature North Korean dictator living inside your brain uh, <laughs> and trying to filter all the information, you know, that comes through and, and make sure it's only positive, uh, you know, kind of like uh, like a dictator would control the press. And I think that, you know, that that impulse is there, right? You, you want to say, well, that's not what I meant. Or, you know, I think you're judging me unfairly to just say thank you. Uh, I think it, it completely changes the tone of the conversation. And then what what I like to see people do after that is just say, you know, I'd love to f- I'd love to check in with you in a few weeks uh, and, you know, update you on how I've applied this to my work uh, or get your, you know, your additional feedback on, you know, on, on whether I've made the changes you suggested. And that shows a real action orientation and then allows you to actually work on the, <laughs> the thing you've been criticized on before <laughs> uh, before you try. I mean, look, the best way to defend yourself is actually to to make yourself better. Uh, there you go. That is a fantastic call out that you can put uh, on your uh, Instagram feed. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on, <laughs> Adam. It has been a great pleasure to be able to pick your brain on Bulletproof Radio today. Uh, people can find out more about your work at adamgrant.net, and you've you've just got this fascinating perspective where you've you've gone deep in your three books. And so for people listening, you want to learn how to uh, be nonconformist, how to have the job that you want, how to design it that way. I think Adam's gone really deep and done real research at all sorts of different levels and orgs. I've certainly learned from the things that he's written and produced, and I hope that you learned from today's episode. And if you did, you know what to do. You could leave a review for the episode that says it was worth your time. And that it means a lot because, well, I see it when you leave a review, but also it'll help other people find shows that were just worth your time. There's an ROI to talk about being strategically lazy for everything that uh, that you do, including an ROI for the time you spend listening to a podcast. And if you got more out of this hour than the hour of your time was worth while you were commuting or working or doing whatever else, then by all means, leave a five-star review and tell people that it's worth your time so that they can make better choices as well. And if you really love the show, pick up a copy of Game Changers and get 500 episodes boiled down with a statistician into actionable advice. Have an awesome day. 